Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this is a fascinating series entitled Making Friends for God, The Joy of Sharing in His Mission. And this is lesson number six in that series entitled Unlimited Possibilities. It's the lesson for August 8 of 2020. And as usual, we'd like to begin with a word of prayer. Our kind and wonderful Father, unlimited possibilities. What could that possibly involve? And how could we be involved? Could we be, could we be a part of that? I'm sure we don't even begin to comprehend how much the Spirit would love to use each one of us. Think of what he did with the disciples, with Paul and with John. Could someone in our day or multiple people in our day have that kind of blessing and guidance and work to be done? May it be possible as our prayer today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. How would you like to be given an impossible task and then be told that your partner has unlimited abilities? God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit with all the holy angels have promised to be with us if we are willing to do God's will. And the important thing to know about God and His calling us to action is that He does not call people who are already qualified. He qualifies those whom He calls. Now, you, a lot of people immediately will say, well, but, 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 but I can't do that. I, I, don't, I wasn't trained as a pastor. I, it, 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 all kinds of excuses. God says, no, if you're willing and you're willing to do some, put some time into it and, and make it a, a, a challenge, an opportunity, I'll qualify you. I, let me just tell you briefly a story about a, a gentleman that I heard. There was a, a church down in Texas, in the southern part of the United States. And in that church, there was an elderly man who was completely blind. And this was a while back where it was probably easier to do this kind of thing than it would be now. But he would go from house to house with an old beat-up copy of Desire of Ages and a copy of Great Controversy. And he would go and knock on the door with his, here he is with his cane, that shows he's a blind man. He'd knock on the door, people's door, and he says, Excuse me, could you spare me a few minutes? To, I'm blind, and I can't read, and I have these two books. Would you be willing to read me a chapter out of these books? <laughs> and he converted far more people for that church than all the rest of the members in the church put together. So don't say you don't have the ability, any, any possibility for witnessing. You have at least that much. Well... The same God who offers salvation to everyone who chooses his way also is more than willing to give a variety of gifts to each of them to accomplish what needs to be done. Acts 1, 8. When, but when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will be filled with power and you will be witnesses for me in Jerusalem, in all, all, Judea, excuse me, all Judea and Samaria, and in the ends of the earth. It was coming, and to the ends of the earth, American Bible Society. Okay. Isaiah 43.10, People of Israel, you are my witnesses. I chose you to be my servant so that you would know me and believe in me and understand that I am the only God. Besides me, there is no other God. There never was and never will be. That's a pretty blunt statement, isn't yeah. it? <laughs> So, so what kind of promises do we have from God, Carrie? Heavenly intelligences are waiting to cooperate with human instrumentalities that they may reveal to the world what human beings may become and what through union with the divine may be accomplished for the saving of souls that are ready to perish. There is no limit to the usefulness of one who, putting self aside, makes room for the working of the Holy Spirit upon his heart and lives a life wholly consecrated to God. All who consecrate body, soul, and spirit to his service will be constantly receiving a new endowment of physical, mental, and spiritual powers. The inexhaustible supplies of heaven are at their command. 
Christ gives them the breath of his own spirit, the life of his own life. The Holy Spirit puts forth its highest energies to work in mind and heart. Through the grace given us, we may achieve victories that because of our own erroneous and preconceived opinions, our defects of character, our smallness of faith, have seemed impossible. That's from Ministry of Healing, page 159, paragraph 4, and they suggest you compare the Desire of Ages, page 250, paragraph 4 to 251. So, how about it? How would you like to work with unlimited possibilities? We know that the gift of the Holy Spirit was first given to those 11 disciples and their associates around about the time of Pentecost. Think over what you know about each of the disciples and other early church leaders. We know a fair amount about Peter and much about John. We know a little bit about James, the brother of John. We know much less about James and Jude, the half-brothers of Jesus. We know that Andrew was always ready to help others who had questions. Uh, he was a kind of people person and always aware of what others around him were doing. Matthew had been a tax collector and was very precise, exact, and accurate in his details. Thomas got the name Doubting Thomas because he was always ready to question. We know very little about the other disciples. And yet God took that motley crew and said he was going to turn the world upside down using them. Who of us would have been, if we had been standing there and known who those people were and what their qualities were, when he first chose them, stood, stood there on the mountainside, what would we have said about them? Yeah. Oh yeah, you chose the best people in the land? Or would we say, God, you could use those guys? Amazing. Did God intentionally choose this group of people with such a wide variety of backgrounds and abilities? Yes. What would be the advantage of choosing people with a wide variety of backgrounds? Well, different backgrounds, different characters have different effects on people, but mm -hmm. it also points out what the rest of us could do. Yeah, and I mean, if you need to reach a, a wide variety of people, some Peter, people do better reaching this kind of people, other people that kind of people. So God knew what he was doing. Yeah. Amazing, yeah, isn't all it? Of them. Look at 1 Corinthians 12, 12 through 22. Christ is like a single body which has many parts. It is still one body even though it is made up of different parts. In the same way, all of us, whether Jews or Gentiles, whether slaves or free, have been baptized into the one body by the same Spirit, and we have all been given the one Spirit to drink. And I'm don't, not going to take time to read the whole thing, but, you know, he, he goes on to say, you know, the body has all these different parts, but the eye can't say to the hand, I don't need you. The ear can't say to the liver, I don't need you, you know. Thus it should be clear to us that while some other church members may do things which seem strange or unusual to us, God can use them to reach people that we could not reach. So which part of the body do you think best describes you? How would the body, that is the church, get along without you? What are you doing to promote the body of Christ? That's the question I would like you to think about today. What are you doing to promote the body of Christ? Romans 12, 4. We have many parts in the one body, and all these parts have different functions. That should be perfectly obvious, right? The human body has an incredible number of different parts. There are trillions of cells all working together for their mutual benefit. Amazing. If we did not have the tiny little bones in our ears, we could not hear. Without our eyelashes, we would probably fairly quickly get irritating things uh, like dust in our eyes and we would scratch our corneas and eventually go blind. And I spent a number of years working in Africa in two different places I worked with uh, leprosaria yeah. and a lot of leprosy patients there. And many of them go blind because they lose a sensation in their eyes and so the eyelashes turn in and they do various other things. And the, it doesn't bother the person, it just scratches away in his eye, he doesn't feel anything, pretty soon he's blind. Yeah. Well, 
And it is, it is that way with the church also. The person who comes in on Fridays and cleans the church is doing an essential service, although we may not even know his or her name. The person who comes in and starts the air conditioner or the heater at the appropriate time is essential, even though not very well known. I mean, think of the churches that are meeting under a tree in other parts of the world. That's about all we're doing here right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So why do you think God is asking, what do you think God is asking you to do for his church? You do not have to be highly talented to serve God's church. You need to recognize what God wants you to do and do it. Each one of us has certain talents and abilities. Some of them may be inherited from our parents. Others may just fit our personality. In 1 Corinthians 12, if we had time, a lot of time, we would go and review all the, the gifts of the Spirit that are talked about there. Ephesians 4, there's a different list, a slightly different list. Romans 12, there's another list. We read about the gifts that God particularly focuses on for building up the church. We need to recognize several things about these gifts. The most important thing we must recognize is that all those gifts come from where? God. From God. 1 Corinthians 12, 11 and 18. But it is one and the same Spirit who does all this. As he wishes, he gives a different gift to each person. As it is, however, God put every different part in the body just as he wanted it to be. And then Ephesians 4, 7, and 8, each one of us has received a special gift in proportion to what Christ has given. As the scripture says, when he went up to the very heights, he took many captives with him, he gave gifts to people. 1 Corinthians 12, 11 tells us that God gives at least one gift to every person. Do you know what your gift is? Do you know what God wants you to do? On December 2, 1903, Ellen White wrote the following letter to Dr. George Hare. This is just a part of it, of course. We're all members of God's family, all in a greater or less degree entrusted with, God's, with God given talents. For the use of them, we are held responsible. Whether our talent be great or small, we are to use it in God's service, and we are to recognize the right of everyone else to use the gifts entrusted to them. Never should we disparage the smallest physical, intellectual, and spiritual capital. As from this letter to Dr. George A. Hare, written in December 2, 1903. Well, Jesus is our example for everything. Carrie? As soon as Jesus was baptized, he came up out of the water. Then heaven was opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God coming down like a dove and alighting on him. Then a voice said from heaven, This is my own dear Son, with whom I am pleased. That's from Good News Bible. Wow. That's the famous thing. And try to imagine this. Um, well, let me just put, the, put the, in, in the next couple of paragraphs here, let, put the, set the picture. Did Jesus have any outward evidence? See, think about that. Let, let's back up and say, Jesus is baptized. He's soaking wet. John the Baptist has just baptized him. He comes up, and he's in the river, so he comes up out of the water, and what, what, what happens? The voice of God comes down from heaven, and a, and a dove, like the Holy Spirit, descends upon him. Now, this is the first evidence that we have in the Bible, of God openly manifesting himself and coming down on Jesus. Well, did Jesus have any outward evidence before his baptism that God was with him? The child Jesus did not receive instruction in the synagogue schools. His mother was his first human teacher. From her lips and from the scrolls of the prophets he learned of heavenly things. The very words which he himself had spoken to Moses for Israel, he was now taught at his mother's knee. <laughs> wow. As he advanced from childhood to youth, he did not seek the schools of the rabbis. He needed not the education to be obtained from such sources, for God was his instructor. And that comes from wow. the Desire of Ages, page 70, paragraph 1. So how did that happen? 
What's happening there? Did, did God actually appear to him? Did God, did, would God just speak to him? Well, he picked up a lot from his mother and the surroundings yeah. to start after that. It's a bit... Uh... But God knew that this young man was going to have to stand up to every temptation the devil could throw at him. He would have to spread the gospel to everybody and speak the truth to everyone who happened to, to be around. Wow. What kind of relationship did Jesus have with his father before he began his ministry? That's another way of asking the same question. Yeah. How did God teach him? We know that he went out early in the morning, before anybody else is up, basically, and communed with God. Well, following the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus, his disciples had an amazing awakening. When Pentecost came, Peter spoke up. Acts 2, 38, 42. Peter said to them, Each one of you must turn away from your sins and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, so that your sins will be forgiven and you will receive God's gift, the Holy Spirit. For God's promise was made to you and your children and to all who are far away, all whom the Lord your God calls to himself. Peter made his appeal to them, and with many other words he urged them, saying, Save yourselves from the punishment coming on this wicked people. Many of them believed his message and were baptized, and about 3,000 people were added to the group that day. They spent their time in learning from the apostles, taking part in the fellowship, and sharing in the fellowship meals and the prayers. We talked about that last week on the program Imagine 3,000 people. The only place I think of that they could have probably met was in the courtyard of the temple. And here they are, right under the noses of <laughs> the Sanhedrin, preaching exactly what the Sanhedrin told them they should never, never, never talk about, right? Yeah. In light of what Peter said on that occasion, is it in your understanding... Is it your understanding that God intends to give the Holy Spirit to every one of us if we are willing to cooperate with Him? The obvious question that should arise in one's mind about spiritual gifts is, what is the reason for God giving us spiritual gifts? Well, here's a couple of verses, a couple of passages that will help us. 1 Corinthians 12, 7. The Spirit's presence is shown in some way at each person for the good of all. So that means God chooses to use each one of us. We may not choose to be used, but if we allow ourselves to be used, God will use us. Ephesians 4, 11 through 16. It was he who gave gifts. <clears throat> he appointed some to be apostles, others to be prophets, others to be evangelists, others to be pastors and teachers, he did this to prepare all God's people for the work of Christian service in order to build up the body of Christ and so we shall all come together to that oneness in our faith and in our knowledge of the Son of God. We shall become mature people. We're supposed to grow up, see? Reaching to the very height of Christ's full statue, stature. Then we shall no longer be children carried by the waves and blown about by every shifting wind of the teaching of deceitful people who lead others into error by the tricks they invent. Instead, by speaking the truth in the spirit of love, we must grow up in every way to Christ who is the head. Under his control, all the different parts of the body fit together and the whole body is held together by every joint with which it is provided. So when each separate part works as it should, the whole body grows and builds itself up through love. That's from the Good News Bible again, Ephesians 4. Christians are not to be like gullible children all their lives. Some places you'll hear the pastor saying about, oh, we need to be like little children. And Jesus said, be like this little child that came to me. Yeah, that's a good place to start, but that's not the good place to end. Okay? As you look around your church, do you recognize people who are gifted for ministry, for serving, 
for, I'm just mentioning some of the one different gifts that are mentioned. Proclaiming, teaching, encouraging, giving. What about being hospitable, showing mercy, being helpful and cheerful? I, my wife would be horror-stricken if she knew I was going to say what I'm saying right now. She's a fabulous hostess. <laughs> and we lived in a, in a sort of central place in the city of Tanzania and later in the city of, 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 of Rusha in Tanzania and Nairobi. And it seemed like every time we turn around, she would be taking care of big groups of people. One night at 11 o'clock, we already had our house full of guests. One night at 11 o'clock, 11 missionaries showed up and said, where, where do you think we should stay tonight? <laughs> what do you say? <laughs> Come on in. So she was a marvelous hostess. I, I, I'm not afraid to brag about my wife. Um, so what is the relationship between these spiritual gifts promised by God and natural events, natural talents, I'm sorry? If we have natural talents, does that mean that God cannot use those natural talents? Of course not. The special gifts of the Spirit are not the only talents represented in the parable. It was in... It includes all gifts and endowments, whether original or acquired, natural or spiritual. All are to be employed in Christ's service. In becoming his disciples, we surrender ourselves to him with all that we are and have. These gifts he returns to us purified and ennobled, to be used for his glory in blessing our fellow men. Ellen White, Christ Object Lessons 382. 328. 328. <laughs> One of the things that is supposed to uh, happen in a church is for the leadership to help us identify our spiritual gifts and shows us how to use them. Show us how to use them. Is that happening in your church? Do you have natural talents that perhaps you have used for other purposes but which could be used in the church to build it up? Seventh-day Adventists are famous for their identification of the seal of God and the mark of the beast. Notice what these verses teach us about the seal of God. Carrie? I'm reading from 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 20 to 22. For it is he who is the yes to all God's promises. This is why through Jesus Christ our amen is said to the glory of God. It is God himself who makes us, together with you, sure of our life in union with Christ. It is God himself who has set us apart, who has placed his mark of ownership upon us. Okay, that's the seal of God, his mark of ownership upon us, okay? And who has given us the Holy Spirit in our hearts as the guarantee of all that he has in store for us. And that's from the Good News Bible. Going on, Ephesians 1, verse 13. And you also became God's people when you heard the truth, the true message, rather, the good news that brought you salvation. You believed in Christ, and God put his stamp of ownership on you by giving you the Holy Spirit he had promised. Again, from the Good News Bible. Okay. So how does God put his stamp of ownership on us? How does that work? Any idea? And what would happen to us if God did that to us? If we admit that we belong to God and we're willing to set our selfish motives, interests aside and say, God, use me to spread your gospel, what happens then? Well, look what it did for Paul. Look what it did for John. Look what it did for Peter. Well, look at a couple of passages. Luke eleven thirteen. Bad as you are, you know how to give good gifts, good things to your children. How much more then will the Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? And look at James 1, 5. But if any of you lack wisdom, you should pray to God who will give it to you because God gives generously and graciously to all. And Matthew 7, 7, a very familiar passage. Ask and you will receive. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. Uh, seems simple enough, right? 
What are we supposed to do to identify the gifts God has given each of us? God is more than willing to give the gifts. Do you think God has any hesitation in giving the gifts? Not a bit. He is just waiting for us to give him permission. We should pray to God. If we ask in accordance with his will, he will show us what he wants us to do. Now that doesn't mean you just ask once and God just suddenly takes over and just you don't have to do any more thinking. No, you might have to keep praying. And you might have to look some yourself. And then at some point in time, God will say, yes, there, that's what I want you to do. There, there. Okay. Diane? Not until through faith and prayer the disciples had surrendered themselves fully for his working was the outpouring of the Spirit received. Then, in a very special sense, the goods of heaven were committed to the followers of Christ. The gifts were already ours in Christ, but their actual possession depends upon our reception of the Spirit of God. That's Ellen White, Christ's Greek Lessons, page 327, paragraph 2. Okay, so what's it saying? Those, those gifts are there. All we have to do is let God use them. Let God move in. We need to give him an opportunity. We need to open up that, those minds of ours and say, come on in, Holy Spirit, use me. Notice these interesting ideas. Spiritual gifts, see 1 Corinthians 12, 4-6, are qualities that God imparts so that we can serve him effectively. So who's benefiting from the use of these spiritual gifts? It's supposed to be God's cause, right? Ministries, another term, are the general areas we can express our gifts in. So you may be in the ministry of the Dorca Society. You may be in the ministry of, uh, maybe it's the, the, the pantry that gives out food to, uh, to people. Uh, different places like that. Maybe you're in, the ministry, you're in the ministry of ministering. Maybe you're one of the, the preachers in the church. So, and activities, that's a third category, are the specific events that allow us to use our gifts. So here's how we use our gifts. Spiritual gifts do not come fully developed. As the Holy Spirit impresses you with some area of service, pray that he will lead you to a specific ministry to exercise your gift through an outreach activity. From our Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide for Wednesday, August 5. Now you remember what we said at the beginning of this lesson. God doesn't search for people who are already qualified. He calls. He 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 qualifies the people he calls. As you think back over your relationship to the church and God, have you identified one or more spiritual gifts that you have you have and which could be used in cooperation with the Holy Spirit to spread the gospel? I'm asking you out there. Can you think of some way in which you could serve the, 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 the church? Yeah. Well, Matthew 25, uh, I think we probably have time to read some of those verses, starting with verse 14. At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like this. Once there was a man who was about to go on a journey. He called his servants and put them in charge of his property. He gave to each one according to his ability. Notice that carefully. He gave to each one according to his ability. To one he gave 5,000 gold coins, to another he gave 2,000, and to another he gave 1,000. Then he left on his journey. The servant who had received 5,000 coins went at once and invested his money and earned another 5,000. In the same way, the servant who had received 2,000 coins earned another 2,000. But the servant who had received 1,000 coins went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. <clears throat> After a long time, the master of those servants came back and settled accounts with them. The servant who had received 5,000 coins came in and handed over the other 5,000. You gave me 5,000 coins, sir, he said. Look, here are another 5,000 that I have earned. Well done, you good and faithful servant, said his master. You have been faithful in managing small amounts, so I will put you in charge of large amounts. Come on in and share my happiness. Then the servant who had been given 2,000 coins came in and said, you gave me 2,000 coins, sir. Look, here are another 2,000 that I have earned. 
Well done, you good and faithful servant, said his master. You have been faithful in managing small amounts, so I will put you in charge of large amounts. Come on in and share my happiness. Then the servant who had been, received 1,000 coins came in and said, Sir, I know you are a hard man. You reap harvests where you did not sow, and you gather crops where you did not scatter seed. I was afraid, so I went off and hid your money in the ground. Look, here is what belongs to you. Wow. Think about that. Well, actually, we should finish this story up here, I guess. You bad and lazy servant, his master said, you knew, did you, that I reap harvests where I did not sow and gather crops where I did not scatter seed? Well then, you should have deposited my money in the bank, and I would have received it all back with interest when I returned. Now, take the money away from him and give it to the one who had 10,000 coins. For to every person who has something, even more will be given, and he will have more than enough. But the person who has nothing, even the little bit that he has, will be taken away from him. As for this useless servant, throw him outside in the darkness. There he will cry and grind his teeth. Wow. Notice that the master gave to each servant talents according to his specific ability. They did not all receive the same quantity of gifts. Then they had freedom to use the money they had received in an appropriate way. Notice that the point of the parable is not how many talents you were given at the beginning, it is how you used what you were given. It is the same with God. What matters is not what you have, but rather what you do with what you have. God has assured us that if we use our talents, they will grow. What, what do you think that means? What does it mean to say, use your talents and they'll grow? might start out in a halting way, but as you do it, you, you develop a relaxation and, that, and enlarge that kind of way. Okay. And surely, if you, if you take an example of giving Bible studies, yeah. the first time you do it, you're going to feel really, <laughs> you know, really, you know, you'd have to follow just right on the lessons that are in front of you and try not to depart very far. But after you've done it a few times, you feel comfortable expanding a little bit, adding a little bit. And it will be freer and, and flow easier. As we use our talents, we will find ourselves bound more and more closely to God and the church. And what does that do in terms of the Holy Spirit's activities? If I, if I develop better talents, what does the Holy Spirit do? Give you some more work. <laughs> give you some more work, okay? Well, he he helps. You know, he uses you. That's right. The better your skills are, the better he can use you. Well, there's a long chapter near the end of the book, Christ's Object Lessons, that I would really encourage you to read. It's all the way from page 325 to page 365, and in that chapter, Ellen White describes a variety of talents. The talents that God revealed to Ellen White in that book include. The Holy Spirit. Have you thought of the Holy Spirit as a talent? Time. He's a lot to say about time. Health. Strength. Money. And kindly impulses and affections. Now, are there, I mean, a lot of us have the opportunity to use probably more than one of those. I mean, we all have, certainly all of us here have the ability to use speech. We have the ability to accept the Holy Spirit. We have mental faculties. So it's not like we don't have any talents. None of these are the talents that, that are mentioned in the Bible. Yeah, Kerry? I was just going to say, it depends a little bit on who you're approaching. Mm -hmm. It doesn't always have to be biblical straight off. The talent is talking about a lot of things, but you can sometimes lead it through. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, in 1 Corinthians 12, 12 through 22, there's a list of talents. Let's look at those for a moment. Christ is like a single body which has many parts. We looked at this part earlier. It is still one body, even though it is made up of different parts. And I'm going to drop down to verse 14. For the body itself is not made up of only one part, but of many parts. If the foot were to say, because I'm not a hand, I don't belong to the body, 
That would not keep it from being a part of the body. And if the ear were to say, because I'm not an eye, I don't belong to the body, that would not keep it from being a part of the body. And if the whole body were just an eye, how could it hear? <laughs> and if it were only an ear, how could it smell? As it is, however, God put every different part in the body just as he wanted it to be. And there would not be a body if it were all only one part. As it is, there are many parts but one body. Okay? And look at Romans 12, a little bit different approach, starting with verse 3. And because of God's gracious gift to me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourselves more highly than you should. Instead, be modest in your thinking and judge yourself according to the amount of faith that God has given you. We have many parts in the one body, and all these parts have different functions. In the same way, though we are many, we are one body in union with Christ, and we are all joined to each other as different parts of one body. So we are to use our different gifts in accordance with the grace that God has given us. If our gift is to speak God's message, we should do it according to the faith that we have. If it is to serve, we should serve. If it is to teach, we should teach. If it is to encourage others, we should do so. Whoever shares with others should do it generously. Whoever has authority should, not, should work hard. Whoever shows kindness to others should do it cheerfully. And then finally, Ephesians 4, I like this, group, this passage. Each one of us has received a special gift in the proportion, proportion to what Christ has given. As the scripture says, when he went up to very heights, he took many captives with him, he gave gifts to people. Now what does he went up mean? It means that first he came down to the lowest depths of the earth. So the one who came down is the same one who went up, above and beyond the heavens to fill the whole universe with his presence. It was he who gave gifts. He appointed some to be apostles, others to be prophets, others to be evangelists, others to be pastors and teachers. He did this to prepare all God's people to, for the work of Christ, Christian service in order to build up the body of Christ. And so we should all come together. We shall all come together. To that oneness in our faith and in our knowledge of the Son of God, we should become mature people, reaching to the very height of Christ's full stature. Then we shall no longer be children carried by the winds and blown about by every shifting wind of the teaching of deceitful people who lead others into error by the tricks they invent. Instead, by speaking the truth in a spirit of love, we must grow up in every way to Christ who is the head. Under his control, all the different parts of the body fit together and the whole body is held together by every joint with which it is provided. So when each separate part works as it should, the whole body grows and builds itself up through love. So that's the picture we get from the Bible about the different gifts. So what does God expect you to do with the talents or the spiritual gifts that he has given? Every servant has, come, has some trust for which he is responsible and the varied trusts are proportioned to our varied capa capabilities. In dispensing his gifts, God has not dealt with per partiality. He has distributed the talents according to the known powers of his servants, and he expects corresponding returns. Ellen White, Testimony of the Church, Volume 2, 282. That kind of sounds like the man in, a, in the biblical prophet, parable that went off and he expected returns, right? Yeah. So, you belong to a church. Does God expect returns? Think of the blessings he's given you, life and health and so forth. Would you be willing to share with your Sabbath school class whatever you know about your spiritual gifts? Can you spell out some of the results of your using these spiritual gifts? What would happen in a Sabbath school class if, if people are willing to set up and say, well, God has given me such and such a gift, and this is what I have done, and this is the results? Do you think that would inspire other class members? Can you think of a spiritual gift used by another class member or someone else within the church that has been a blessing to you? Some of us might have been greatly blessed by the spiritual gifts of somebody else. I was immensely blessed by the spiritual gifts of a mentor I had. Basically taught me almost everything I know about scripture. Well, the way, you, the way you approach people or they approach you, I remember 
Some years ago, there was a retired conference president. I didn't know him that well, but he always made a point of coming and saying good morning when I was there. Mm -hmm. I think some of that was for the fact that in the nursing, nursing profession, you usually get shifts here and there. But I, I, I've never forgot, I've forgotten his name, but he, I, it was amazing. You make a beeline out for you, and yet some other people, you never hear a peep out of them. Yep, yep. I, I have a man who was, I know a man who was a member of my Sabbath school class for some time. He's now passed on. But he commented about that. We, we have a very large church, and he, he, he would say to me almost every week, you know, I like this church, but no one's ever welcomed me. No one really cares whether I come here or not. Yeah. I thought, that's really sad. That's true, though. Quite often. Well, do you still have sort of vague ideas about what spiritual gifts really are? I know a lot of people, spiritual gifts, I mean... You know, a lot of people are gifted. Is, is someone giving me something in a package that's un, that I need to unwrap? Or what is this? Are they only given to certain people? Maybe some people have special gifts and others don't. Is that true? <clears throat> we read already two different passages that says every person has at least one spiritual gift. Or could they really be given to everyone? And how can I discover my spiritual gift? Is there a way for us to, to discover our spiritual gifts? I have another friend that um, was in a, 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 was a female a woman, and she was in a class with other, a group of, of other women, and they were talking about spiritual gifts, and they said, you have a real gift of teaching. You are gifted as a teacher. She said, what? And then finally said, you know, yeah, I do. I do like teaching, and I apparently do a pretty good job of it. She didn't even recognize her spiritual gift. Could that happen to some of you out there? Stop and think about what kind of things that you can do comfortably, that, that you like to do especially. Are those things that God could use somehow or other in your, in your life? Now, there's some of us who are extroverts, and we're happy to speak up, and happy to say hi to people and so forth, but others are introverts. But God has a way to use each one of us if we are willing to be used. So we need to understand clearly that spiritual gifts are given by for two purposes. These are not something just for our enjoyment. They're given, one, to build up the church, and thus, two, to fulfill the mission of Christ in reaching the world with the gospel to build up the church. How many people go to church and think this is, a, this is a club we go to on Sabbath mornings to meet our friends? Well, I don't know, but it's, sometimes it seems a little bit like that yeah. in some churches. Yeah. And we have already said in this series, earlier lessons, we said the pastor's job was really, his main job was supposed to be teaching the church members how to witness, how to go out and carry out the, the work of God. He's supposed to be a leader in teaching other people how to witness. Wow. If you belong to a relatively small church where you know every other church member, you might be able to think of some spiritual gifts that other members have. If you belong to a much larger church where there are many members that you do not know personally, it might be more difficult. But as we learned at the beginning of our lesson, having a variety of people in your church is a blessing, not a liability. The Holy Spirit knows what gifts should be given to each person. Review again the spiritual gifts that are spelled out in 1 Corinthians 12, Romans 12, and Ephesians 4 we read a moment ago. Do you feel a burden to reach out to the people around you by using your spiritual gifts? Do you wish that you could find someone that you could share the gospel with? Remember that you do not have any natural abilities, any natural strengths, any talents or spiritual gifts that were not given to you by God. So doesn't he have the right to ask you to use them for his cause? 
Spiritual gifts are specifically for the purpose of benefiting the church. They're not just for our entertainment. Thus, how they are used and where they are used may be different from natural talents. Natural talents are often used to earn a living, become wealthy, maybe even for self-glorification. But the true use of spiritual gifts is very different. Now, that doesn't mean that you couldn't use a talent which perhaps you've used in the past for earning wealth yourself or self-glorification, as our lesson says. But that talent might be very useful in some way or other, some way in building up the church. It is, it is God's plan that when someone is convinced of the truth and chooses to join the Seventh-day Adventist Church and be baptized, she or he should be taught immediately about spiritual gifts and how she or he can be used to further the gospel. So, what are we saying there? We're saying, you know, so often, unfortunately, people, we get the idea that, okay, once you're baptized, you're sort of automatically ushered into the kingdom of heaven. And don't, no one has to worry about you anymore. That's not the way it should be. Not at all. People who have been baptized are just... Jesus. What did Jesus say about baptism? That's birth, right? Yeah. What, what would happen to a baby if you said, okay, you're born now, sit over there and take care of yourself? They wouldn't do very well, right? So what kind of things could we do for new church members that would help them to grow? Well, one of the things I, I like, and which I have spent a lot of time in my life working on, and you can find about it on our website at theox, that's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G, there are study guides for each book of the Bible. And you can, you can take people, sit down, just ordinary people, and say, read through this book this week. Next week we come back and say, what did you learn from this book? And in those study guides, you'll get some, some clues about the kind of questions you should ask and so forth. It's an incredibly enriching experience. You can go all the way through the Bible from Genesis to Revelation doing that. And it would be, and, and if you get excited about it, you learn some things, then what do you do with things you're excited about? You tell others, right? That's what we're supposed to do. Well, if people did that, then she or he, these, these new converts, would need to understand how to share that information. Or soon, they would soon learn to understand how to share that, that information with others. In light of what we have studied in this lesson, do you still have any questions about these words, some of which are quoted in item number 33 above? To everyone there is given a work to do for the Master. To each of his servants are committed special gifts or talents. And to one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to every man according to his several ability. Every servant has some trust for which he is responsible, and the varied trusts are proportioned to our very capabilities. In dispensing his gift, God has not dealt with partiality. He has distributed the talents according to the known powers of his servants and he expects corresponding returns. Okay. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 2, page 281 through 3, 282. Yeah. Well, would you like to choose which spiritual gifts you receive? You ever thought about that? No. Would you like to be a prophet? <laughs> Boy, I tell you, I've been, I've been looking through a lot of uh, materials written by Ellen White about the challenges of her life. These are, these are letters she wrote to different people talking about uh, various things, experiences she went through. Oh, boy. Yeah. She had it tough. Hmm. How would you like to be given to the job to, to go to the general conference president and tell him he's doing everything wrong? Boy. Well, think back to the time when you were a child. You might have dreamed of getting something special that you wanted as a birthday gift. But when your birthday came, you got something probably far more useful from your parents. <laughs> Are we willing to admit that the Holy Spirit might understand what gifts we can best use even be better than we do? The Holy Spirit distributes His gift to believers in attendance with His knowledge in of their... 
Okay. Oh, excuse me. In accordance with his knowledge of their capabilities and the needs existing in the experience of each individual, it is not an arbitrary decision, but one based on supreme knowledge and understanding. SDA Bible Commentary, Volume 6. So think about it now. If God is giving spiritual gifts to people, and he has the supreme knowledge that he has about everything, wouldn't he want to give you the knowledge that would best be used in your setting? Wouldn't that make sense? Here you are in your place. Here's the people around you that need to be reached. And God will say, hmm, let's see, how can I reach these people? Well, if I give Jim or Carrie or Diana or Ken these gifts, they will be able to reach out to the people around them. It might be good to practice identifying some of the spiritual gifts and other members of the church. See if you can recognize a spiritual gift if you see one. Here are some of the categories that are specifically mentioned. Apostles, prophets, teachers, evangelists, pastors, as well as others who demonstrate hospitality, liberality, helps, mercy, faith, and healing. It's important to, rec to notice that the word apostle in Greek is equal to missionary in Latin. So do we have missionaries in the church? Yeah, we have missionaries in the church. And you don't have to be someone who travels overseas to a foreign country somewhere to be a missionary. You can be a missionary right here. Next door neighbor. Yeah. Prophets are people who speak on behalf of God. Another word for prophet really would be ambassador. That's an appropriate translation of, of the word prophet. Not for making predictions for the future. No, that's just a very small part of the, of the work of a prophet. But we must first clearly understand what it is that the world needs to hear about God. Our spiritual gifts will not be used properly until we develop a genuine desire to build up the church. And the most important things we can, ways we can build up the church is to tell the truth about God, right? In conclusion, let us talk about three things that we can do to discover and use our spiritual gifts. Ask God to show you your spiritual gifts and how it or they can be used. Look at a couple of verses. James 1.17 Every good gift and every perfect present comes from heaven. It comes down from God, the creator of the heavenly lights, who does not change or cause darkness by turning. So every good gift comes from where? From God. God, and he doesn't change. Yeah. Look at Matthew 7. Ask, and you will receive. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. That's a pretty simple, straightforward uh, uh, description, right? Talk to your friends and counselors in the church who, who, who know you well. Ask them what skills or spiritual gifts they might have recognized in you. Um, your husband, your wife, anybody who knows you. They will recognize certain qualities you have in your, in your life that are appropriate. Um, begin using any and all gifts that you are able to identify. Now, we, we've already said a couple times in this lesson that if you use those gifts, what happens? They increase. They increase. They Improve. become, yeah. You, you get to, I mean, I've known some, I've known some people that could just, they could speak the truth about God. It's just natural as they, they breathe, you know? And that's the way we should be. You know, the, the title we've got here is Making Friends for God. Yeah. Of course, in John 15, 15, mm -hmm. he says, uh, I don't no longer call you, actually, he's, it, don't call you slaves anymore. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the word generally is translated as his servants. Yeah. But uh, don't call you a slave. You're not a slave to your former way of life or uh, something like that. And uh, I call you friends. Imagine, a friendship is a horizontal relationship, isn't yeah. it? It's not a hierarchy, uh, or a hierarchical relationship. And so then uh, all of this, and sharing the joy in his mission. Well, as I remember in John 17, uh, verses 3, or 1 to 4, mm -hmm. but verse 3, he says, uh, Eternal life is to know the Father, Mm -hmm. And Jesus Christ, whom you have sent, and uh, then That's the next Jesus' prayer, right yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, and and to know the Father is uh, it, and Jesus Christ, who is mm -hmm. is eternal life. Mm -hmm. So, 
what, what is the purpose of all of this? Is to, we, we think, go, go, die, go to heaven. Yeah. Okay? Well, then we got uh, uh, the, the next verse, verse 4. Jesus says, I have accomplished the work you gave me to do. Yep. I have made known your character. And of course, John 7, excuse me, what is John 14, 9, you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's what all of this uh, that we've been doing for, for years to, trying to do is uh, make, uh, or that's what the make church, God look good. Yeah. Uh, Th that's what the church should be doing now. We should, helping people to understand the misinformation that's coming from Satan so we can reject it and to promote the, the positive stuff that's coming from God so, we, so that uh, it becomes more accessible to people, they understand it better. Remember that many gifts do not come fully developed. We may need to take some time using the gifts to develop it or them to its full or their, to its or their full capacity. And a good opportunity to do that is to sit down with your class, Sabbath school members or other things and practice. You need to give a Bible study, practice on each other, for, for example, uh, as, as an opportunity. I mean, Jesus, my understanding, came to teach yeah. and not to pay a penalty for sins. Right. Uh, and uh, he, it, it, what was it, first, what was it? Uh, Colossians 1, 19 and 20 and the yeah. Ephesians 1, 9 and 10. It wasn't until Jesus' death that the heavenly intelligences came to understand that God really could be trusted. Yeah. So, he, talking about the Holy Spirit, will, who will give himself, uh, I'm sorry, he, talking about us, who will give himself fully to God and will be guided by the divine hand. He may be lowly and apparently ungifted, yet if, we, if with a loving, trusting heart, he obeys every intimation of God's will, his powers will be purified, ennobled, energized and his capabilities will be increased. Are you ready to launch yourself into work with an with unlimited possibilities? And right. it says trusting heart, he obeys every intimation of God's will. Obey means a willingness to listen. That's yeah. what I've learned over the, over exactly. the years. Obedience. That's what the word in the Bible, the word that's translated obey means a willingness to listen. And it has to, to do with our thinking mm -hmm. ultimately. Yeah. So that's what we need to do, folks. Think about what you've heard, study the lesson for yourself, and let's practice. Let's pray. Our kind and loving Father, we study these lessons because we look, we're looking for insights and direction from you, and we, we appreciate the work that has been put into them and, and all that they, that they can teach us. May we now go forth in, in, endowed with power guidance from the Holy Spirit to reach out to others and, and win them for the gospel is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.